Dr. Jemsek, absolutely amazing Lyme literate physician, one of my mentors. And, and you know, these are the few things as a physician that we should all imbibe and, and live by. Your worth as a physician only truly begins when you first engage in patient care. We all know that. The patient is your best teacher. I certainly have found that, yes. One you should always listen to with respect and careful consideration. You know, if you see any doctor who is not willing to listen to you, yeah, 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 okay, you have this, here's a prescription, bye-bye, next patient. Don't ever go back to him. If, if a physician cannot respect you as a person, does not have time and respect to listen to you, to listen to all the suffering that you're going through, that is not, not the right, right physician for you. If you fail to listen to the patient, the only reason you exist as a physician, you will learn nothing. You, you know, as you practice medicine, that's true, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you can be a pill pusher, MD, for the rest of your life, but you will never have the kind of respect and love and gratitude from your patients as you could have had, had you been a, a good listener. So when you're dealing with patients that are chronically ill, it is very important to relate or don't see patients who are chronically ill. Just to say, you know, it's, it's not my field. Okay, the great imitator. Look at all of these diagnoses that Lyme disease can mimic. It is known as the great imitator. See, ADD, ADHD, allergies, lupus, it goes on and on. Sinus allergy, I mean something small as sinus and allergy problems. Okay, never mind. Uh, Epstein-Barr, fibromyalgia, Guillain-Barre syndrome, hair loss. Yes, hair loss too. I've had women come to me, they pull out hair, comes out in clumps. This is, and I'll get into it, but yeah, th there are certain cytokines that increase, like TGF beta 1, you know, that cause toxicity in the hair follicles, and you see hair falling out. I lost half of my hair, and I had no idea what was going on. Like, it just comes out in clumps four or five times a day. Unexplained weight loss or weight gain. Please always be aware of that. Okay. The role of co-infections. Co-infections, the most important factor you need to remember, all of these, right? Babesia, Bartonella species, uh, Babesia species, Bartonella species, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Mycoplasma. Here it just says fermentants, right? But mycoplasma pneumonia is also a very important co-infection. Uh, chlamydia pneumonia and herpes viruses. Most of the patients I see end up between 11 and 15 co-infections, which we have to work with. And the important part here is all of these co-infections continue with the immune suppression. It leads to a suppressed immune system. I hope everybody here knows that the number one job of Lyme disease is to suppress your immune system. Okay, Bartonella. Bartonella is known, you know, they're all sometimes fatal. We recently, in, in, uh, in the US, I believe it was in Cincinnati, Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, there was a two, two to three year old little girl who went outside to play and she came back with a speck of dust, a dot on her eyelid. That was a baby tick. Nobody knew, you know, it was a, spe a speck of dust on her eye. And you know, beautiful eyelashes, little girl, nobody even looked over there. Uh, she had a very high fever. She went to the hospital. Within one week, she died. 
nobody understood what was wrong with her. You know, she rapidly lost functions of multiple organs. And eventually, her uh, autopsy showed that she had Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And that was a tick that was attached to her eyelashes. So, unfortunately. But yes, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Babesia, Ehrlichia, these are all, you know, with Ehrlichia, when, when you have a Borreliosis patient that you've treated everything and this patient still has fatigue, and you see the white blood cell count decreasing, and you see the platelets decreasing, just always suspect Ehrlichia. And even if you cannot run labs, I would treat it. And there is a beautiful herbal protocol for treating Ehrlichia. I will go over that. One second. OK, cool. Okay, this is what I've learned from Dr. Jemsek, and um, this is the mechanism why Lyme disease can persist in people, okay? First of all, Lyme exists in many forms. It exists a spirochete, the L form, the blebs and vesicles, and a cyst form, okay? It may survive inside the cells, outside the cells, in the extracellular matrix, in body fluids and tissues. Okay. It's a very adaptable organism. Okay. It is multi-systemic. Research shows that the spirochete has been isolated from different tissues like synovial fluid from the joints, the skin, the cerebrospinal fluid, the brain, the blood, muscle, lymphatic tissues, heart, kidney, and spleen tissues, splenic tissues. Those are some of the um, microscopic pictures. You see all different forms of the spirochete existing at the same time, right? That's exactly what happens in your body. Massive inflammation, systemic inflammation. Okay, so what happens? So we have active immune suppression and we also have immune evasion. There are two separate mechanisms that are used by Borrelia. Okay. Um, I get, you know, I'm sorry, I have so many examples and stories in my head. I'm, I'm trying to choose which one to tell you, but, you know, um, a, a very common lack of knowledge that I see. In physicians, yes, but, but you know, uh, in common people, it's a lot. They come to me, they say, oh, I have a fantastic immune system. Oh, you do, really? How do you know that? Oh, I'm never sick. Uh, I never get sick, uh, I never get fevers. I have a fantastic immune system. And they really believe that. They really believe that not getting fevers, not getting sick, um, it means that you have a fantastic immune system. So I'm like, you couldn't be more wrong because it is good to have a fever once in a while. You know, once or twice a year, it's important that you get sick. That shows that your immune system is robust, it's up and running. So if you're coming to me and saying, oh, you know, I have a son who is autistic or who has dyslexia or ADHD, but he's very healthy. You know, he has a phenomenal immune system. That, that, that really doesn't jive, does it? It doesn't make any sense. So yes, if you have immune suppression, that has to be looked at. Why are you not getting a normal immune response? And immune evasion. So let's look at the immune suppression first, right? Uh, the immune system has two branches, yeah? The innate and the adaptive immunity. So you will see complement inhibition. You will see inflammatory cytokines. You will see uh, a lot of activity around the toll-like receptors, you know, the um, um, monocytic 
cells of the blood, they show a, a, an uprising, a lot of activity. Uh, these, these can all be seen in labs. So the innate immune system is your first line of defense. It, it immediately activates any time it sees a threat. The adaptive immunity comes in a little bit later, but it stays longer and it learns. You know, you, your adaptive or acquired immune system is the immune system that learns. So if you get chickenpox once, then you know you you have your memory cells that learn chickenpox, and then you don't get chickenpox again. That is the adaptive nature of that branch of the immune system. So um, induction of cytokines happens in that branch of the immune system as well. You have the complement inhibition happening there. Most importantly, the immune complexes will rise in your labs. This can be seen in labs as well. Now, the immune evasion mechanisms of Borrelia, right, they can, they can show gene conversion, not their genes. They can do that. They can convert our genes uh, and variable expression of antigens, okay, variable expression of surface antigens. That is the reason why the Western blot keeps changing because the surface antigens, you know, sometimes I'll see OSP A, OSP B, OSP C, sometimes two of war. What is going on? Like, what is going on with the patient? So um, it takes years and years of clinical practice to be able to understand uh, that, that it's borreliosis and what stage of borreliosis it is. Um, other mechanism of immune invasion, the last one, is your physical seclusions. Intracellular, extracellular, they can hide as, as a cyst. And immunologically privileged sites, that is where the immune system doesn't really patrol all the time. And we will also see that if you are exposed to a lot of electromagnetic radiation, you always have your iPad and iPhone in your face, um, or you're always working in front of a computer, that creates a no immune system zone. And uh, the immune system will not patrol body compartments that have been exposed to a lot of electromagnetic radiation. It, is, it will not go near that. Some more mechanisms of persistence, you know, it's, it's not more, it's, it's like further looking into depth. And as you can see, there have been 70 plus research papers published all the way from 1966 that Borrelia is a very smart organism, okay? So we already talked about this. We talked about active immune suppression, immune evasion, and physical seclusion. But this is a little bit more detail. Okay, a couple more slides and then I, I, I guess we can uh, go to break. Uh, Post-Lyme residual physical symptoms, right? This, this is the persistent Lyme disease that we see. Sinus problems, sore throat, muscle pain, nose bleeds, skin infections, eczema, dermatitis, fevers, night sweats, especially in perimenopausal women. Do not confuse these with your hormonal imbalances. Many women do. Fatigue, weakness, malaise, stamina, sleep issues, migraines, hair loss, digestive issues. This can happen years after you've been diagnosed with Borrelia. Are you, are you aware that any further suppression of your immune system can reactivate your Lyme disease if it is in remission. Anything, if you have emotional trauma, you know, you break up with your boyfriend, somebody dies in the family, divorce. Uh, if you have any kind of a physical trauma, you know, concussion, head injury, car accident. If you get any, anything else, like a major flu, major virus, these can all reactivate your Lyme disease. And you end up with these residual 
symptoms that happen. So we looked at the physical symptoms. These are the residual neuropsych symptoms. Memory, executive function, mood, uncontrolled emotions, dissociative states. Some patients get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, lupus, Parkinson's, stuttering, word finding difficulty, light and sound sensitivity. So misdiagnosis with um, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue is also common. I was diagnosed with CFS uh, in a fibro. Uh, I had stuttering, word finding difficulties. I still have light and sound sensitivity. I need to meditate like, you know, between eight and 10 times a day to be able to stay focused. Okay, so those of us with chronic Lyme, how did we get here? Why did we get sick? You know, how come there's people walking around that have had tick bites, you know, and they don't get any symptoms? Why are you still sick? And what's keeping you sick? Right? Was there a perfect storm inside you? I think so. I, I know I had one. But everything just falls apart. Everything just goes wrong altogether. Were you sick before Lyme? Yes. I mean, um, many patients have other problems. Or did Lyme make you sick? So it's, it's often both, isn't it? So when you get Lyme disease, it causes immune suppression. So all of your past issues or all of the other issues that you thought were minimal or that you had recovered from, those come back. So it, it becomes difficult to decide, you know, what came first. Was it just bad luck? Right. I think it was all of those, wasn't it? Toxins, illness, stress, mold, infections, genetic mutations, and more. Um, for you physicians in the audience, do you guys look at any genetic testing? Do you do methylation genetics sometimes? HLA-DR patterning? No. Well, it's going to be fun then, learning about all this as, as we go through it. Do you look at any epigenetic triggers? I mean, who, who, who looks at epigenetics in, in you know, 40-year-old? Right? People may look at epigenetics in little kids with autism, but you know, yes, it is important to look at epigenetic triggers. Infections, um, antibiotics. Many of us growing up may have had many, many rounds of antibiotics, whatever, ear infections, strep throats, right? Keep in mind the damage caused by antibiotics stays with you until it is repaired. It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grown up now, I had multiple doses of anti, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying one or two episodes in a year, I'm saying like, you know, there are some of us that get repeated ear infections and throat infections. So that is the, the, the important part, is to keep that in mind, to look at mitochondrial damage, right? You have to look at your environment, you know, uh, what kind of a house are you living in? Is there a basement? Is there water damage? Is there uh, paint fumes? Any other volatile organic compounds? You have to look at all of that. You know, what kind of clothes are you wearing? What kind of pots and pans are you cooking in? Are you cooking in Teflon? Um, pesticides, herbicides, vaccinations, EMFs, and of course, you know, uh, do you have any toxic relationships. Electromagnetic frequencies. 